uh, have a, a bit to talk about today. So I want to thank everyone for coming. I've heard uh, good things about the sessions today and, and uh, glad you're all able to make it. Um, and, and thanks for sticking around for the last session. Uh, this is, uh, you know, we, we all uh, talked about some some uh, great adoption with Richard just recently. And, and now I'd like to kind of talk about, you know, protecting your information and, and how you can go about it. Um, you know, what are the features available to you within Microsoft 365? Uh, so, you know, hence the, 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 ten, you know, the, the, uh, the title is, you know, you have sense information, so let's, let's protect it and what those options are. Uh, to start off with here, um, I want to make sure we thank our sponsors. Uh, you know, without these great sponsors, this wouldn't be happening today. So that's, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, and on top of that as well, I understand that uh, if, you, uh, if you submit a feedback here for this session, which I've actually labeled here our my, my session here is, is 295412, so 295412. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear your feedback. I, I always enjoy getting uh, getting feedback on, on the sessions that I present and, and uh, where I can improve or what you liked about it and that sort of thing. Um, okay, so let's dig into this a little bit. I'd like to start off with, you know, just kind of explaining who, who I am. Uh, my name is David Drever. Uh, I am a senior manager with Protivity and a, I think, six time now, uh, Microsoft Office Apps and Services MVP. Um, I, uh, I specialize in SharePoint and records management uh, and information protection. Those are the main specialties I, I uh, uh, deal with. And this session came about because, you know, I had lots of clients that were asking, you know, we're, we're working in the cloud and, and we're moving our, our data into Microsoft 365. And, you know, especially with when the pandemic started, how do we protect that data? So that's kind of where this session came from. Um, and so to kind of get, to give you an idea of what we're going to be covering today. Um, so we have a, a few key topics I want to cover. And unfortunately, you can't cover them all. There's just, there's just so many different ways to protect your information. Um, but what we'll cover today specifically, um, you know, we're going to start off with Microsoft Information Protection. Uh, then we'll kind of dig into uh, data loss prevention. And from there, we'll move into conditional access. Um, we'll touch upon Defender for Office 365. And then we'll finish off, uh, hopefully we'll have time, with Defender for Cloud Apps. Um, so that's that's what we're going to cover today. These are there's There's a lot more tools that you can use within Microsoft 365 that can help protect your information and protect your uh, your structure, your infrastructure. But these are some of the, the five main controls or, or features that will really help you out throughout the, the, uh, the you know, protecting your information. So let's first kind of dig into, you know, why is security important? And, you know, there's obvious reasons, but let's just look at some of the details here. So, you know, 73% of enterprises today have at least some form of component of their business in the cloud. And as soon as you have something that has to do with your business in the cloud, that means you're storing information in the cloud. So whether it's stored there, whether it's presented there, it doesn't really matter. You're going to have that, um, you know, that component there. So you need to be able to make sure that, that the information that deals with that is, is, is protected, you know. Uh, and enterprises saying they're going, and this is per, this is not obviously not global. This is like, you know, some enterprises are predicting they're going to be, they themselves are going to be investing, you know, three and a half million dollars just in cloud technologies, whether that's applications or hosting services, things like that. And a lot of that information you store is, you know, it's got PII, personal identifying information, things like, you know, maybe your health card or employee number, um, you know, credit card numbers, you know, that that's there too. Um, health, or, uh, sorry, uh, license plate numbers, you know, or license numbers, those, those are all kind of information that can be stored in the cloud. And in some cases, some organizations don't even know it's there. Um, and, you know, less than half of these organizations actually have a cloud security policy, like a formalized cloud security policy. Um, I remember having, you know, conversations with an organization um, that I was working with that, you know, we were talking about, you know, they've got their data in the cloud. And I said, well, you know, how are you protecting it? And, and they said, well, we don't really have any documented way that we're protecting it. It's, it's just kind of we're just doing the best we can. And, and, and so what this this session's about is, you know, helps you understand what's available to you and what you can do to protect your information. Um, so the other thing is, is why, you know, why is it really important is, 
you know, security breaches happen and, and it's just, you know, it, it's a fact of a fact of life. And, and um, the, the scary thing is, is that if you take a look at those numbers and this was a, a recent uh, stat is, um, you know, 79% of large U.S. businesses have indicated they've had some form of data breach and 49% in Canada. Um, why that number is so different, I don't know. It could be just who responded to the survey. Um, you know, and, and when you go into small, medium businesses, you know, the numbers aren't a whole lot different between the two organizations. So, you know, data breaches, they happen. And, and why, you know, inside job, insider uh, job, or was it, you know, they didn't have things configured properly? It's it's just something you need to be available or be aware of. So let's talk about Microsoft Security itself. So at the high level, you know Microsoft contains a number of features, and I'm only listing a few of them here. Like you know, you have an Active Directory, so being able to control permissions on based on security permissions and things like that. Exchange protocols, you know, monitoring your data is going back and forth and your data flow, uh, mail flow rules and things like that. Microsoft Information Protection, we'll dig into it a little bit more here, uh, the ability to, to label or, or control your sensitive information. Um, Azure audit logs um, are really huge. In fact, Microsoft's built a whole new uh, tool around logs and, and, and monitoring and alerts and things like that called Azure Sentinel. And, uh, and unfortunately, we'll be getting into Sentinel today but you know it's it's you know it's it's becoming such a huge component of being able to track what's going on and, and what happened that you know products are being built around that um, you know products have been around for a while like things like Splunk and, and that sort of thing so um, as well as you know other security um, you know right out of the box with Microsoft 365 is everything is encrypted no transmissions occur between even between services within Microsoft 365, everything else is, everything's encrypted. Um, and you also have, you know, multiple ways of protecting your information through uh, permissions and security and things like that. So using Azure AD, uh, using, you know, uh, elevating access based on roles and things like that. Um, it's not something we're gonna deal with particular today, but you know, you can actually have what's called a zero trust environment, which means that no one has a standing admin access. No one. You know, your global admins, they don't actually have a global admin account. What they have is the ability to become a global admin through uh, privileged identity management. And so, you know, what that means is that I can um, be sitting doing my work and then I need to access, you know, some uh, administrative control so I can actually request access to be able to do that. And you can either just log it or you can actually, excuse me, you can actually have proper approvals to control that. So these are things that you can do from an administrative perspective to protect your information or protect your environment. So let's dig a little bit into uh, Microsoft's information protection. And what that deals with is, is the ability to actually, you know, classify and label, and in some cases protect your, um, your sensitive information. Whether that information is, you know, open to the public or internal only, or restricted to certain users, or even restricted to a very, very small group of users. Microsoft Information Protection can allow you to do that without having to change permissions on every single file. You know, if you have particular files that are part of a folder of information that only certain people should have, like you can even have, you know, if you're in a project using Microsoft Information Protection, you could have, you know, financial information in the same location as uh, non-financial information, and you can actually use encryption through your labels to protect that information so that you don't have to have a bunch of permissions on top of things. Um, the, th the great thing about Microsoft Information Protection and different than other tools is that um, like other tools that have some form of a, uh, you know, a protection on content usually is based on the container that it's in. So you can encrypt that data, but it's once you pull it out of that location, once you pull out of that tool, it's, it's no longer encrypted. The, the removal or pulling it out of that, that location actually removes the encryption. 
with Microsoft Information Protection, it actually uh, applies the protection to the, the document itself. So if I was to um, take the document from a SharePoint site that was protected with the MIP label and encrypted, I could actually take that document, send it to a colleague who did not have permissions on the encryption side of things, and even though it's not no longer in SharePoint, I emailed it to him or I sent it to him on a USB stick or whatever the case may be, he or she still will not be able to open it because even though it's not under the control of my domain anymore, the MIP label is still applied to it. And in order to open it, I need to be able to authenticate to the system in order to access that information. And if that's, that's the key thing with Microsoft Information Protection is it actually travels with the document. And so you can actually do things like, you know, track where the document was tried to open. So if, you know, suddenly you have documents that are showing up being attempted to be opened in, in you know, in another country, perhaps you have a data breach you, you aren't aware of yet, you need to look into. So these are the things that you can actually track using MIP. Um, you know, on, on top of that too, um, you know, you also have the ability to, um, with MIP now, there's also what's called the MIP client or Azure Information Protection Client. At some point, I don't know if it's been completely renamed. It, the scanner has been has not been renamed. The client itself has. So Microsoft MIP client means it actually allows you to use your labels defined in Microsoft 365 as locations or sorry uh, uh, to actually label the content that isn't Microsoft 365. So if you have file shares that you, you don't have documents in, in SharePoint or Teams or OneDrive or anything like that, you can actually label that document on your file shares using the sensitivity labels that you have um, deployed into Microsoft 365. So you do actually have that ability um, to go beyond just Microsoft 365. And then on top of that, there's there's also some capabilities within the server itself that you can actually control your content. So you can apply sensitivity, you know, based on the, the content it detects. So um, if you know if the document contains credit card information, well, that should probably be encrypted uh, against accidental use. Um, you know, it should be you know if it, if it detects you know personal identifiable identifiable information in there, things like your health card number or or your uh, uh, employee number, because you can create custom ones. Uh, you have, you know, you can actually protect data automatically on the server that the the system itself can actually apply a label, uh, and you don't have to just turn it on and, and then all of a sudden your content is not uh, available to you anymore. You can actually um, simulate it, do a do a test, and they'll provide reports and let you know if you need to refine your settings or not. So the controls are there and the testing ability is there. And what this does is that it allows you to encrypt the data even if the user hasn't opened up the document to do that. So most of MIP um, uh, applications happen when you open the document and you have to either you know, apply it yourself or you can uh, allow someone else to, or sorry, uh, you know, have the system scan your document as you have it open and then it applies a label, makes, makes a recommendation. But this server side, which is you know, relatively new uh, for MIP, uh, it, it's you can actually do it without any user intervention. So it's 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 the the, the possibilities are are broadening uh, vastly. And from a user perspective, you know it's it's fairly straightforward. You know you can have a sensitivity bar where you have the different levels of sensitivity. Um, if we take a look here, the um, uh, you know this this piece over here uh, that deals with the client confidential. What that is, is that's just a, an example of, you know, when I, when I hover over top of client confidential, it's actually going to tell me, what do I mean? What is a client confidential document? So you, you can actually do that sort of thing. So the, uh, so you do have these different, different ways of, of being able to, to flag your content. And, and then at the same time, being able to see, am I applying my, my documentation uh, uh, properly or not? Um, and then you can change the sensitivity. And uh, one thing about uh, MIP as well is that you can actually group specific labels together. Uh, and by doing that, uh, you can have like two levels of, of authentic or classification. So let's say for instance, you know, HR because of the type of data or finance because the type of data they have, they 
you know, have some specific labels that are different than the rest of the company, they could have a grouping of finance labels. And then underneath that grouping of finance labels, the labels that have labels that are specific to them. So those are things to, you know, to be aware of and to consider. Um, now, MIP uh, isn't just about, you know, encrypting your data. Um, encrypting your data, and, and actually the first thing I'll tell you is don't encrypt everything because there is a user experience to be considered. When you encrypt your data, when you encrypt your emails, the decryption process takes time. It, it's not instantaneous. So if you have to add, you know, three to five seconds to every email you open or every document that you try to try to read, the user experience is going to go down. But sometimes when you're dealing with sensitive information, it's not so much about encrypting it. It's making sure people are, are, are aware when they're working with the document that it is in fact considered sensitive. So you can add things like headers and footers. Uh, in the example here, you can see I have client confidential. So we have a watermark on the page and we have you know, headers and footers there. And what's great about this is that um, what I'm doing is I'm actually not just, I'm not controlling things by encrypting the data, I'm making the user aware. Hey, I'm working with something that's a little bit more um, sensitive than what I normally work with. So I gotta make sure I don't send this to someone else or I don't share this outside of the organization. And what you're doing is you're, you're trying to find the, the happy medium between being able to control that data making sure that the user experience is there. And with you have good user experience, then you have good adoption. And if you have good adoption, things are gonna get used properly, but you still have the ability to, um, to share the content or to share your content work together and things like that. Um, and the, the other, another nice thing about, you know, user protect or sorry, user adoption as well is the ability to change things really easy. You know, using that, that, uh, that little pencil icon there, you can actually change the values and the, con the configuration of how your, your content is, is protected. Um, when you are dealing with protection or encryption of data, you actually can you know, further control that as who has access. Um, what do they have access to do? Can they copy it? Can they copy content from it? Can they make changes and save it? Can they print? You know, <coughs> excuse me. These are all things that you can control. Um, one thing I would like to be, uh, you know, uh, want, want people to be aware of, though, is that when you start getting into um, these custom MIP labels, and, and this is not something that's well documented, at least it wasn't last time I looked. If you have a custom controlled or custom permissioned MIP label, you lose the ability to collaborate. You can't co-author anymore. So it locks it down to whoever has it at that point. It's kind of like, remember the old checkout check-in that, that uh, you could use or you used to use with SharePoint and, and that sort of thing? It's the same concept. Um, if you have a label where the permissions are defined on the label itself, um, which is, then you can actually maintain your, your collaboration um, features. But in a label where you let the user define who gets access to the encryption, you do lose that uh, ability to uh, to encrypt or to, to collaborate. And just so everyone knows, I am uh, I am kind of watching the uh, chat here. So if you have questions, please don't uh, hesitate to throw a question. There, I'll be happy to answer anything. All right, so let's move on here to uh, data loss prevention. So, what exactly is data loss prevention? You know, the first thing people think of is, you know, data loss prevention is the ability to stop people from sharing content they shouldn't. And it's true, it does do that. But it's also um, the ability to, to um, know where that content is. So, you know, you want to protect the, the, uh, your data from being sent to, you know, your competitors, to, to media. I worked for one organization uh, at one time that was a was a government uh, agency, and they didn't have any of this this uh, uh, capability. And the the government uh, had the someone had access to files that they actually leaked to 
um, an, another party, like another political party, um, because they had access to that. So these are things you need to think about when when dealing with data loss prevention. It's not just about accidentally sharing content that has like a credit card number in it. Maybe it's sharing content that has industry or not industry um, uh, company secrets in it and things like that. So it's more than just the the obvious. It's also thinking about the stuff that might not be so obvious. Now, a lot of times too, you know, why DLP may not get picked up is because people think that you know I have my data controlled by security. I know I have my I have my passwords in there. So is that not enough? And unfortunately, it, it isn't because, um, you know, security only protects the data where it's located. What if I take it out? What if I take that data and move it to a, a uh, you know, I take it out of SharePoint where it's protected by, by passwords and I email it to someone? So, you know, this is what DLP does is it, it watches for, you know, watches you when you send your information, watches how you share the information. Um, you know, and in some cases too, if you get, you know, uh, you know, an, an external intrusion, someone, you know, hacks the system or whatever the case may be, you know, you, you want to be able to, you know, access or be, be aware of your content that's being shared because of that. Um, you know, so how, how does this get out of my control? And, you know, we talked about email, you know, taking um, something that's sitting, sitting in OneDrive that is protected, uh, by, by security, and then I drop it into a OneDrive, or not sorry, OneDrive into like a Dropbox or a box or something like that, uh, like some other cloud um, tool, a storage tool. Because what happens is, is that I, as an uh, as a organization, I can control my cloud storage. So I can control my um, OneDrive, but I can't control David's OneDrive or David's um, Dropbox location. So you know, you have, you don't have that control um, with, without DLP, uh, you know, portable, true, uh, portable storage, so with USB key, things like that. So where does DLP and Office 365 come into play? Um, you know, it's, like I said at the beginning, it's not just about protecting the sharing of your content, it's also about knowing where it is. So you can actually use data loss prevention policies to, report and find and identify your sensitive information. You can create custom rules uh, around KQL and, and things like that based on the content of, of defined data uh, and things like that. So say for instance here, you know, if you wanna make sure you're protecting against PII, um, you know, an employee number by itself may not be a big deal, but what if that employee number in the same sentence has my name? So now, now that becomes a that becomes a PI, PII document because it has, you know, it's it's you can connect my name to that employee number. So you can actually write queries that allow you to, you know, if you see a name near this number or this type of this type of data, then it can be considered PII and you can elevate it in using DLP. So there's different components of a DLP policy. Um, there's what's called the condition. So, you know, basically what it sounds like. So if this is happening and there's the action, do this. So like for instance, you know, if this data is contains a um, Canadian health card number and it gets shared outside of the organization, then I have to do my action. Do I block it? Do I, um, uh, just report on it and that sort of thing. Um, and you can actually um, point it at specific locations. You can say this, this one only applies to OneDrive or this one only applies to SharePoint. Um, you can have like one rule, you can have multiple rules within a DLP policy. So it can get fairly complex as necessary. Um, other components, uh, you know, of, of your policy, you know, the notifications, who needs to know when uh, something is is uh, it's happened when when a, a processor when a, a DLP rule has has a, has fired um, an override can somebody actually override this rule and usually by default um, most administrators and and most security managers uh, will allow overrides because there's usually uh, a business reason for you know, sending data out or sharing data that contains this information. 
but you can force people to justify it. You can enforce them to say, this is why I'm sharing this data. And all of that information is audited and all that information is reportable. So if I turn around and I um, say, I'm sharing this information because of this reason, um, when the notification goes out, that actually is shared with the with the um, uh, the the receiving uh, the person who receives the notification, and you can customize how much information is actually received. Uh, we did one I did one um, uh, project with a with an organization that because of because the notification was sent through email, they didn't want the title of the document that was uh, in question to show up in the email. They wanted to make sure that the person who received it had the unnecessary access to go into the console and view that uh, the rule that was overridden, so or the notification that was fired. So you have that ability. You can include all of the details, or you can include as little as possible, and just say, you know, this this rule was fired on on January twenty first at at ten p.m. or something like that. So these are things that you know you can configure within a DLP policy. And then, of course, reports can be generated as well, um, and, and that sort of thing. And there's, there's, I have, we have time here. I can kind of show you. There's like data classification uh, uh, consoles within the Microsoft 365 compliance console that can report on on these different things that occur. So all of that information is actually at your fingertips. It's not just kind of like a, a build the build the policy and, and forget about it. It actually do have the ability to get auditing and reporting on it and things like that. And then, you know, there's kind of, you know, the policy is always running and it's always scanning. So when a DLP policy runs, it actually runs against your search index. So, you know, we, we make change to our document. So we're, we're starting, you know, we start here at the top and we're, we're making changes to our document. So then, you know, search crawls that change. And then it checks. So once the crawl is done, it, it does a, an, update, excuse me, an update of the index. Then the DLP policy says, oh, index has changed. Let's change, just check to see if any of the new policies are fired because of that uh, change. And then it'll take whatever actions it needs. And you know, it's, it, then your content changes again. It goes through it all. So it's, it's just one big circle that, uh, that occurs and is occurring all the time. So what that means is that, you know, as I'm making changes to my content, it can actually scan and tell me if suddenly I've made a change that needs to be protected. Um, just a you know, just a point, a, a note to, to be aware of is that MIP uh, uh, labels can do this as well. So you can actually get double notified. You can get notified both by the MIP uh, MIP label and by the um, uh, DLP policy as well. So that is more around, so MIP policies and DLP policies are around, you know, kind of focusing on, you know, on, uh, uh, you know affecting uh, protection of your content. And what's great about this, so a lot of this sounds a little bit, you know, the DLP is very automated. It's very much controlled in the back end. MIP is very hands-on in some cases where users have the ability to check their, the, to um, apply the labels. But Microsoft is really starting to build in the ability to, you know, have users, uh, sorry, have the system, you know, use automatic processes to do this for you. Um, there's uh, a term or a, there's a, a feature called trainable classifiers. And a trainable classifier is I have, you know, a number of documents. And, you know, these are all documents are all in the same same way. It's sort of like if, you, if we have any sessions today about, you know, um, uh, SharePoint syntax where you can build document models. Um, a trainable classifier is very similar. <clears throat> it's not quite as robust and uh, I guess it's nowhere near as robust as um, a data model or a, a document model in, in syntax. But the concepts are the same where, you know, you, you upload a number of documents and say, okay, these are client or uh, customer invoices. And so, what happens is, is that it'll, it'll then you then you upload some more content that are you know not uh, a mixture, sorry, a mixture of um, positives and negatives, and then you you train the con the the system to 
to know when it's a, a customer invoice. Now, the what it doesn't allow you to do is it doesn't allow you to say, all right, so this contains, this is like David's customer invoice, so this is actually going to be, you know, highly restricted. And, and this is, you know, someone else's and it's only confidential. It doesn't, it's not quite that powerful, but what it can say, this is a customer invoice, so I'm going to suggest or I'm going to apply a confidential um, label to it for you. So th there are those capabilities coming, uh, there are out already and they're being built on all the time. So moving a bit away from, um, you know, protecting of the data directly, let's talk a little bit more about protecting the resources that um, contain, that the data is contained within. And the first one we're gonna talk about is conditional access. So conditional access is, you know, it's part of Azure Active Directory. And what it does is it is it's just targeted at specific users um, or groups or whatever. And the idea behind it is, does this person have access to the content? Or um, if they're accessing this content, do I need to do anything different? So, you know, do I need to elevate it? It helps you in this, this it goes up beyond you know, uh, your normal security and saying, you know, do I have a zero trust on in, in the system? So for instance, let's talk about uh, from this perspective, anytime you have an administrator logging in, you may want to ensure that, you know, that administrator, because they have that elevated access, you do not want them to, um, you know, if, if a password gets stolen or for whatever reason they get, they get spoofed, you know, you don't want someone coming in with that level of access. So you may require that as soon as someone logs in, they have to log in with um, multi-factor authentication. So if they if they have that level of, of uh, access being uh, being used. So this is what conditional access does. Um, you know, it kind of goes beyond just your security permissions. Uh, and you can actually do it in real time. It happens all at the same time. And it gets granular. You can actually... It's not just about accessing SharePoint. It's not just about accessing uh, data in OneDrive or accessing uh, a server in, in Azure. It's, it's about how are you doing it? So I'll get to that in just a little bit more here in just a second, but I want to kind of walk you through the process of actually how conditional access works. So in conditional access, you have what's called a signal. And so the signal is, um, you know, what am I doing? Am I accessing SharePoint? Am I accessing an Azure resource? Um, am I doing it from, uh, an, you know, am I, am I located in Canada? Am I located in, um, you know, uh, Sweden or something along that line? Um, did I log in this morning in Canada and in, within hours, I suddenly am logged in from another country entirely? So it actually, that's, those are all different parts of the signal. And then based on that signal, what do I do? Do I give them access? Do I give them access, but first they have to uh, do what's called increased assurance, which usually requires multi-factor authentication. Do I limit their access because they're no longer, um, you know, accessing it from a location that I consider is trusted? Uh, you know, and, and, and then and then the conditional access, and once that decision is made, it actually enforces that. So, you know, the signal, like I said, is is the concept of, you know, what where am I coming from? Um, who's requesting it? So is it David? Does David have a have higher level of access? Is David an administrator? So if David's an administrator, then that's one of the signals. Um, you know, one of the things you can have is what's called a known location. And so what that is, is that if you happen to know what your external IP addresses are within your office, and if they're static, then you can actually use that to say, okay, if, if, this, acts, if this information is being accessed from within my office, I don't need to worry about MFA. But as soon as I log in from home, we need to make sure it is in fact you, and we're gonna require you to do MFA. So these are different things that you can actually have as, as a signal. Um, and then on top of that, you know, you, it, it, it will also say, uh, and this is actually kind of interesting, is that um, a colleague and I were working on a tenant the other day. I'm in Canada. He's in Ontario. And 
because of the way that we were, our tenant was configured, we actually had to share one account. And so we started getting alerts that we had impossible travel occurring because um, I would log in and then half an hour later, he would log in from Ontario. And so what that does is it actually deals with Azure identity protection now and it actually raises the risk on my account. So then you can also have, okay, so if David's coming in now and previously he had a higher risk because of impossible travel. So we need to make sure this is in fact David. So we have to fire off MFA. Or we say that David can access the data, but he can't download it or he can't edit it. So you know these are all things that you can do with conditional access. So while it's not necessarily you know data specific in the sense that MIP and DLP are, it still has controls in how you access your data. And then like, um, you know, there's some other things around too, around that decision is, you know, if David is coming in from outside of the, outside of the office, then, you know, maybe we need to make sure that he can't connect unless he's running through uh, a compliant device. Is that device um, registered with an Intune? So now we're bringing Intune into the mix. You know, is it hybrid Azure AD joined? Hybrid Azure AD join means basically that, you know, my workstation exists in both the on-premise AD or at the very least it exists within Azure AD. So it knows about my workstation and it's a trusted workstation. So all of these things are different things that you can do to enforce. So if I connect from home and I'm using my own personal machine, then I'm no longer Azure AD jo joined and I'm also not compliant. So then, because of those reasons, I'll now raise the, the security access and, and require an MFA login or something along that line. So that's the, you know, that's the idea behind conditional access. And you know, kind of talked about this already. Um, you know, it works with Intune. It works you know, as part of Azure AD. Um, it's, well, okay, Cloud App Security, which is now called Defender for Cloud Apps. So it's, it integrates with all of those components. And I'll, I'll kind of talk a little bit more about the, the Defender for Cloud Apps or Cloud App Security here in just a minute, because it's kind of it's kind of uh, how it brings it all together. So there are some leading practices around this. When you create a new policy, um, don't deploy it to your administrators. When you create a conditional access policy, you can actually exclude people. And so the rule of thumb is <clears throat> when you're first um, creating a policy, first you can report on it. Once you've reported on it, then you can maybe look at turning it on. Because um, what the report does is it doesn't actually do any enforcement, but it'll tell you where it would have enforced. So exclude your administrators from the beginning. Uh, and the reason for that is the um, if something goes wrong or you didn't configure something properly, you don't want to lock out your entire organization. You don't lock out your administrators because then it just gets really hard and you get Microsoft involved and, and, and things like that. You can also utilize what's called a what, what, what if tool. And basically the what if tool allows you to um, build a situation. So I can, I can actually do a what if David logs in on a non-compliant device um, and he's located in, um, you know, uh, Toronto, Ontario, when he's supposed to be in, in Canada, or sorry, in, in Alberta. And so he, he logs in from Toronto, Ontario. What is going to happen when David logs in? And so what the what if tool does is it takes that information you gave it and it runs it through all of the policies that you have created. And it'll say, okay, um, nothing's going to get fired. Nothing's going to get fired. Oh, this one's going to fire. It's going to require David to have MFA because of this rule. Or David's going to get blocked because of this conditional access policy. So these are things that you can do to make sure that you don't actually you know, stop people from being able to access their content. Now, that being said, if you have, um, you know, excluded your your uh, your manager, your administrators, and things like that, once the policy is tried and true, you you do want to bring them back in. So it's only a temporary thing. So this is leading practice for creating new things, but not um, you know for for all time uh, and, and that sort of thing. So all right, so. 
Uh, let's move on to Defender for Office 365. So Defender for Office 365, it used to be called um, uh, Advanced Threat Protection. And Microsoft renamed it uh, last year to um, you know, Defender for Office 365. Defender for Office 365 protects your environment against some of the more social things, things like uh, phishing attacks and you know malware and 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 that sort of thing. Um, you know, getting malware on emails, getting you know uh, emails that that invite you to go to this link to change your password because your your account was suddenly discovered as being compromised. Um, and until last year, it was it was limited to just uh, just email. But now you can actually do it. It actually to uh, email and and, uh, and uh, SharePoint because it can actually scan SharePoint documents as well. But now it can actually uh, scan Teams and even Teams messages. So if you had something that was open, you had guests involved, and they're trying to send out links that were not uh, not uh, proper, and they're they're spoofing who they were. Uh, it actually can scan uh, Teams now as well. And there's some different components to your, your Defender for Office 365. So it was called Safe Attachments. And this is you know exactly what it sounds like. Scans your emails for attachments. Um, and then depending on how you can how you configured, you can just monitor and just reports. You can actually block the email entirely. Uh, you can replace the offending attachment with a text file that just basically says that this was replaced because of a, it found malware. Um, you can, um, uh, what's called enable redirect. And the idea behind that is it actually just redirects the email to a quarantine location for someone to review, review it before it gets uh, released. And then there's what's called dynamic delivery. Now, most environments, I actually suggest enabling dynamic delivery for safe attachments. What dynamic delivery means is I'm gonna let you read the email I'm, while I'm actually scanning the uh, attachment. And the reason for that is that sometimes when you're getting attachments, when you're getting emails, sometimes having that email is as important as having the, the attachment as well. But you, and it sometimes it's time sensitive. So the idea behind that is if you're a very large organization, you know, Microsoft really has scaled these things up quite a bit. But if you are part of a fairly large organization, that dynamic delivery is, is key because you could have thousands of emails being scanned at once and it just takes a little bit longer. So you get the email, you just don't get the attachment yet. So that's the idea behind uh, dynamic delivery. Uh, and then you have what are called safe links. And so very, very similar to uh, you know, uh, safe attachments is safe, safe links is that it'll actually scan your uh, links that are sent to you in emails or, or uh, messages. And it will um, actually, you know, it actually doesn't just, uh, it actually does a complete um, travel through. So it'll, it'll follow the, the whole link. Does it get redirected at some point? And then does it get to a site that actually has <clears throat> some malicious code running in the back end? So it'll actually will scan all of that all the way through from, from start to end. So from your email or your message all the way to where you actually end up. And what's great is that it's not limited to just you know, Outlook and Exchange, you can actually run it in Office Docs as well. So Office 2013, right through to the latest version, um, you can it actually runs in your mobile apps as well as iOS and Android. So you actually have that protection across multiple devices and platforms and, and, and uh, versions of documents. And similar to your safe attachments, you do have the ability to, you know, configure what you're going to do. Um, you know, do you apply it at real time um, do you give them the message? Um, you wait until it's finished scanning. Uh, with with links like that, you know, uh, I, I usually I, I, I usually suggest you wait because you don't want them to uh, to click on it too soon. You also have like, with the real time. What that means is is that when I click on the link, it's going to scan it ahead for me. Because when it initially received the email, maybe at that time it wasn't a problem. But when I clicked on it they had changed something on the other end that redirected me and the initial scan didn't catch that. So your real time scanning will actually scan ahead. So that's why you kind of sometimes see it, it feels like it's going a little slower and that's simply because it's scanning ahead to protect you. Um, the do not rewrite URLs, what that means is, is that um, when you, 
if you do not select that option, uh, what it's going to do is uh, when the URL comes to you, it's going to have like it's going to point to a location in your in your tenant. So the URL is going to look very confusing. So usually I suggest leave that on there so the person kind of knows where they're what it's pointing at. It doesn't change what happens when you click on it. It's still going to point you to the protecting the way to protect your information uh, or to protect your 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 travel and your browser. But what it will do is it will um, uh, just not rewrite it in the email so it, it, the user can actually see what they're clicking on. Uh, then you have your anti-phishing policies. So what this does now is it actually will help protect you against attempts to get your um, your emails because it you know trying to fool you into clicking on this link or or filling in your information. Uh, and there's some different types of phishing that it will protect against. There's there's spear phishing. Uh, which is, you know, it's called, it's, it basically uses focus, you know, customized content that's specifically tailored to, to a particular user. So if you happen to be, you know, uh, an organization that releases who your key executives are and their email addresses and stuff like that, I could create something that looks specifically geared to my CEO and, um, and then have them, and they, they say, oh, this is obvious is for me because it's been, it's been customized. It looks exactly like it's been made for me. So I'm going to put in my information and, and they're going to steal it. So that's what spear phishing is. Um, similar to spear phishing is what's called whaling. And that's basically um, spear phishing, but like going for the, uh, the board of directors and the executives and things like that. So you're going for the big fish, going for the whaling. Um, then there's what's called BEC or business email compromise. And what this does here is that, you know, users, you know, it uses forged trusted senders. So, you know, people like, you know, people you know within the organization, organization, financial officers, you know, HR, things like that. And it makes sense all it's coming from them. Um, and so then, you know, if it, it pretends it's like an HR saying, I need you to update your, your, we lost your social insurance number or something along that line. So you actually have the ability to protect against that kind of a situation. And then of course, ransomware. So it, it helps you to um, detect if, you're going to be clicking on something that's going to turn around and encrypt all of your data. So you do have the, the ability to, to do phishing campaigns or protect against phishing campaigns like that. Uh, and then you have real-time reporting. So it'll report on like pr problem areas, you know, threat protection status report where it informs you of all the malicious emails that you received, um, you know, safe attachments reports, um, safe attachments merge you know these these different types of reports have actually been deprecated but they've all been brought into what's called the threat protection status report which is basically a, a really large report dealing with all of the malicious attempts that have happened within your organization um where they happened who they happened to did it happen to a particular department did it happen to a, a couple of a couple of specific users which allows you to you know kind of do some more investigation there um, uh, you also, additionally, you have what's called attack simulation training and it used to be, what was used to call the attack simulator, but basically they, they renamed it to attack simulation training because you're not using it to catch people. You're using it to help train them to make sure, help sure that make sure that they actually do understand if something is coming or if they've received an email, they probably shouldn't have. So, um, you know, you have different types of attacks that you can, you know, protect against. Um, credential harvesting, so sending users to a page uh, where it attempts to get them to log in there, put in their login credentials. Um, you know, attaching a, a, a malware, um, but it, so it simulates actually sending a malicious uh, in, attachment, and and if you click on it, then you get a, an email uh, stating that you know you clicked on something you shouldn't have, and this is what you need to look for. Um, you know, a link, like same thing, similar to an attachment, you can do a link in an attachment. Or link in link to malware, or link in your in your documents. You can do f campaigns around that. Um, you know, uh, there's another one too. We do what's called a drive-by URL, and the idea behind that is that you send a link that looks really similar to say Amazon, and when you click on it, it takes you to a page that looks really close to Amazon, um, and then you enter your email, and then now they've got your Amazon the Amazon credentials. So you know you have the ability to to run all these different campaigns 
And the reason why you know we call it training is that it helps you identify. Oh, maybe my users they 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 they, they failed horribly. They they gave all they gave away all their their information. Um, so maybe you know helps you understand. Oh, maybe I need to do some more training with these particular users to help them understand. You know, this is what they need to look for. Okay, so we're kind of getting to the last topic here, and I think we just got a few minutes left. So uh, I think we're going to get this done here pretty quick. So Defender for Cloud Apps. <clears throat> this used to be called Cloud App Security, Microsoft Cloud App Security, but they wanted to go with a similar naming scheme for everything. So we got Cloud Defender for Cloud Apps. What this is, is Microsoft's Cloud Access Security Bro Broker, or CASB. And basically, it is the first thing that you hit when hitting anything in your tenant, and it's the last thing that you exit when you're trying to get, trying to leave your, um, uh, leave your tenant. So you can actually, um, you know, track what's happening by a particular user as they come in and what the, where they came from, all that kind of information. Um, you know, it's, it gives you the ability to report as well. Do I have a lot of, you know, attempts coming from this location? Do I have a lot of attempts um, being made to this particular piece of data or this location? Um, and it's, it's like I said, uh, in you know, my last bullet there, it's your first point of entry and your final point of exit. So it's, you know, it's both your first line of defense and your final line of defense. So it's, it's going both ways. And you, you have, you know, what does it allow you to do? Um, you know, Defender for, for uh, Cloud Apps, you know, it has, I think, I think there's more than that now, but it was 16,000 different cloud-based applications that you can actually integrate and scan for, for being used. So are your users, you know, sending data to Dropbox? Are they sending data via Google uh, Mail or, or or something along that line? You know, um, and it can run, you know, check for different types of risks and that sort of thing. So really, what you're doing is you're 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 trying to identify shadow IT where users are trying to get around the the, the controls and and things like that 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 your IT uh, personnel put in place. Um, it helps you detect against cyber-based attacks. So, you know, helps you detect, do you have malware going around? Do, are you getting hit by malware? Are you getting hit by denial of service? You know, these are different things that it helps protect you against. Um, here's kind of a, a good way of looking at it. So, you know, you've got your, your, you've got your traffic. You can see, you know, um, in order to get into some of my information, I need to go through Cloud App Security. You have what's called cloud discovery. So if you have on-prem firewalls, you can actually have constant upload of your content or of your firewall log. So it can detect what's happening on your in your environment as well. And it can provide your reports and provide protections. So it's not just about protecting your, your cloud entity, it's about protecting you at the at your tenant or sorry, at your um, your firewalls as well. And you can actually, you know. If I am not even touching my tenant, I can still use my firewall logs to say, does David share or put information that he has on his laptop? Does he move it over into Dropbox? Does he move it into, um, you know, onto, uh, does he send an email using uh, Google or something like that? Because even though I'm not um, using my firewall, I'm not, I'm not using my Microsoft features, or my tools to do this, it's still being tracked by my company's firewall. And so that firewall log gets continuously uploaded. It's a continuous thing. And you can have immediate alerts coming from that. So it's, it's, it's almost real-time protection there as well. Um, yeah, so it's, like I said, it's, it's, it's real-time protection. Um, you know, helps you protect against data theft as you're actually reporting in real time. And then, you know, it actually integrates with Cloud App, uh, you know, Access App Control as well. So it helps you protect your, your data, helps you know when data is being downloaded. Um, you know, one thing that you can do as well is that if you're trying to send out data that has no label, even if it doesn't have to be an encrypting label, it just has to be labeled, you can actually block it or report when users are actually not applying labels before they send out content. Um, because, you know, you have policies in place that need to do that. You can even block use uh, conditional access Oh, sorry, um, uh, Defender for Cloud Apps to block uh, the use of different applications and 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 that sort of thing, or, or flag when people are using that application. So, so that that is all the different things that you can do here with, with Cloud App Security, and, and it's kind of what um, 
what this this next diagram here is kind of shows you how it brings it all together. So you know you have your cloud your defender for cloud apps, and you can see in the diagram you know you've got encompassing all of the different tools and all the different protections in there. Um, but inside of that, it works with conditional access. It works with access or sorry Active Directory. It works with Intune, and it integrates with all of these different tools in order to determine um, you know is your content at risk by this person coming in and accessing your data. So I think that brings us to nearly the top of the hour. I, I, uh, I would, um, if you guys have any questions, I can stay on here and, and answer any questions for you. Uh, again, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors. And uh, again, also too, um, like to hear your feedback. Um, the, the speaker ID or the session ID is 295412. You got the scan there to the, the feedback. Uh, so I really appreciate any feedback you guys have. It was great. If I if I, I didn't talk about something that you really wanted me to talk about, um, I can do that for next time. Um, if you want to reach out to me at any point in time, here is my information. So again, uh, david.dreverportivity.com. That's where you can get a hold of me at any time. Uh, I, I carry my, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm too, uh, my wife says I'm too too, too, too up to my phone. Uh, I tweet on David M. Drever and I blog at prairiedeveloper.com. Um, and I have just started um, uh, actually releasing some video blogs as well about how to do some of the things that we're talking about. Um, that's linked in uh, from prairiedeveloper.com as well. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending tonight. Uh, really fantastic. I, like I said, I'll stay online here in case anybody has any questions. But I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, thanks to all of the organizers uh, and for, for setting this up and for hosting. It's been a great time. Thank you very much.